This is Katrin with Disability Rights New York. Welcome to our podcast, Empire State of Rights, closed captioned for a featured episode of the director's chair. These episodes feature our executive director, Tim Clune. He'll be speaking with guests about important topics and the work we are doing together in our community. Today, we welcome John Robinson, president and CEO of Our Ability, Inc. He and Tim will be talking about the 31st anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, how things have changed, and what work still needs to be done. John, Tim, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's great to be here, Catherine. Thanks for inviting me. John, will you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and Our Ability, Inc.? Catherine, it all started in a small town. Um, no, it, it, it kind of really did, actually. Um, I'm 52 years old, born without the extension of my arms and my legs, uh, quadruple amputee, um, born this way. I was raised in a smallish town in upstate New York and then went to prep school in New England uh, for junior high and high school. And so I had a, had a pretty interesting upbringing a pretty sheltered upbringing though, too. Uh, you know, the, the prep school that I went to in New Hampshire was, you know, I think I graduated with 50 people. So we were a small school and I, it's funny looking back on it now, being a quadruple amputee, you know, profoundly disabled physically, um, that sheltered experience probably helped me in some ways and probably hindered me in others socially. But uh, graduated, went to Syracuse University to study television, radio, film. Uh, really wanted to be involved in TV because I, I loved sports and couldn't play sports. There was no adaptive sport, sort of the way there is now. And so uh, my my voc rehab counselor suggested, hey, you know, the way to be involved in sports without being involved in it directly is indirectly in television. So studied at the Newhouse School, lived with eight guys pretty much for four years, and four of us were in the Newhouse School. And upon graduation, which was in 1990, the same year that we're talking about, uh, the year that the ADA was was signed was the year I graduated college. And my peers all got jobs. Uh, one roommate got a job with the newspaper in Newark, New Jersey. My second roommate, uh, who happened to co-write my autobiography, got a job immediately in the golf industry and has worked for Golf Digest, Golf Magazine, and Golf Channel, and, and still writes for the golf industry. And my third roommate got a job immediately with the National Basketball Association and now is runs NFL films. And then there was me and I was unemployed. And uh, a big part, I don't know what the percentage would be, but a big part of that is because of what I look like. You know, three foot nine, no arms and no legs, uh, you know, isn't the recipe to go sell advertising in a TV station. And so um, was unemployed for four and a half years and still eventually got a job in television, had a good 16 year career, but wanted to give back. And what I wanted to do was to help myself, you know, a generation later, which is let's create a mentor network. Let's create an online portal. Let's, let's help people with disabilities assess and build their skills towards employment because employment is the great catalyst for equality. And, um, you know, I, I realize that now it's easy at 52 to look back, right? But the truth is the the voc rehab counselor telling me to go into an industry that I would like to go to work changed my trajectory. Uh, I didn't accept Social Security disability benefits. My parents uh, either didn't know about it or didn't accept it. Thank goodness. And then I went off to work. And so that's what we want to do with our ability. We you know, we've done a lot of things, we, but right now today, we're working on a worldwide portal to assess and build skills through artificial intelligence that match to real jobs. And you know, we're really blessed right now that we're in this network of international organizations building this thing. And uh, we're, really, we're really lucky to do that. And it's, it's all because I wanna help other people with disabilities. You know, we are a disability owned, disability run, organization that helps people with disabilities. And that means the world to me. And so let's start the conversation about the ADA. As you said, you were talking about 1990. That's when this passed. Uh, John, Tim, let's start by talking about the background of it to begin with. So 
I'll just jump in quickly, but I'm, we're going to want to hear from you, John, on this. But, you know, 1973, the Rehabilitation Act um, was passed and it addressed certain issues regarding accessibility, but certainly it wasn't enough. And, you know, in 1990, when the ADA was signed, there were high hopes for this law to really, really make a difference. And it has, on some level, made profound changes. I was, so interestingly, John, you graduated um, in 1990. I joined this organization in 1990. So, so there, there are, you know, we have some good goalposts. As, as a 12-year-old, Tim? Yes. As a 12-year-old? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Isn't that amazing? It's like, yeah, it is. I haven't aged a bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> So what I found in, in the next decade, um, and, and this, this is one of the sad truths about the ADA, was that we spent all of the 90s fighting about who was covered by the ADA and whether a particular person with a particular disability was actually protected by this law. And what I, you know, for me, it was never getting to the merits because you're always fighting about these issues that really shouldn't have been issues, whether someone had a disability that affected a major life activity um, was, was problematic. So much so that 18 years after the passage of the ADA, it was amended in 2008 to address specific Supreme Court decisions that had been made that really limited the applicability of the ADA. So we are at least in a better position, you know, post 2008 and getting to matters, you know, on the merits as opposed to having to fight who was covered. We're 31 years out and there is still a lot more to be done on just basic, basic things. And John, you know, you can please jump in. Yeah. I, I have, I've got, I guess I've got two minds on this. Um, you know, in my second cup of coffee in the afternoon mind, um, I'm a little calmer about it that, you know, we have to realize how young we are in, in the diversity space. Um, and I think about this a lot, you know, I, if I had been born 15 years early, I was institutionalized without an education. Um, and who knows what that looks like. And if I had been born a hundred years ago, I'm, you know, I'm drowned out in the backyard in the pond. Um, you know, I, I, I get it. Like, I, I don't not think about that. I do think about that. We're, we're really lucky right now. Of course, that doesn't mean we shouldn't stop pushing. Right. So my my morning coffee when I'm all amped up is, you know, let's push, let's do more. Uh, I think what I what I would like to see is, you know, we need to embrace those those, those um, trail runners before us that have that have made changes. We need to embrace the how important that is, and now we need to look for for leaders and people to be vocal who are disabled to speak up and, and be active. I think the frustrating thing for me is, you know, Tim, you guys live it every day. We live it every day. We're immersed in the disability world, but you speak to somebody in, you know, government, it can be, you know, state, local, federal, doesn't matter, who doesn't have a person with a disability. They just don't get it. They, they still just don't get it, how important it is. Um, you speak to, I speak to businesses all day long. Obviously those that are, care about disability as part of, uh, part of diversity, you know, they're starting to get it, but still need leadership with, as people with disabilities. I think the, what we have to do is ask more, um, ask more of us, um, ask more of government, ask more of business to make an intentional act. Hire, work with, um, partner with, people with disabilities to understand why it really matters. And so, you know, the afternoon me, the calmer me, it's like, you know, we've come a long way. We should be proud of what we've done and when we're still making progress. The morning me, 
is let's go, you know, let's, let's hurry up and get stuff done because it matters to somebody's, everybody's life, right. With a disability. Um, and, and that's kind of where I am with this, that, that, uh, you know, we're 31 years later, a lot of this, to your point, a lot of this should have been done right away, but you know, you realize change does not happen overnight. And so we're on a continuum. And so right now I choose to look at it today as, Hey, we're going to be better at 32 than we are at 31. So what are the steps that we can do this year to do that? And, and who does that directly affect? So you know, I mentioned we do the job portal that we've been working on around the, around the world. And that's great. You know, it's, it, this morning I had a webinar with people in the United Kingdom and Indonesia and India, Canada, and here. And it's neat to be involved in that. At the same time, I got an email from somebody using our system, just wanting to input their skills, right? I care a lot more about that one person wanting to input their skills to make sure they get a real job. And we we can't lose focus on that. And, you know, I think one of the reasons I do that is because I'm that kid. I I was him. I'm not going to say his name, but I was that person. I, I wanted to input my skills so I could find the job so I could you know, buy the house, buy the car, get married, and have the life that I want. Um, I think sometimes we forget, and I don't mean I don't mean you at all, Tim, but sometimes we in disability world forget that there are specific people with disabilities that need specific things to 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 improve. And it's our responsibility collectively not to forget that. A couple of reactions. One, please keep having two cups of coffee a day. Um, I think don't that perspective is important, and both of them are very, very important to hold on to. So please, um, I share some similar. I, I tend to have a little bit more coffee than that, so you can only imagine what it's like for me later on in the afternoon. But we have to not lose sight of of the people, and and I think that 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 is that is really important. You know, as our office is basically a law office and we we do litigation, we do advocacy, we do outreach, we do education and training. And it, it is real. It's motivating when when we see issues that need to be addressed, but but it, it is as important to remember that there are people behind those issues that need to have some type of remedy, some type of closure, some type of success there. Um, what what I have found discouraging is is the lack of or maybe it's not the lack of, but just the ignorance in a lot of the courts that we practice in regarding the issues that we want to address. And I feel like we are often educating a judiciary that should otherwise have been educated. And the way it happens is by offices like DRNY appearing and and providing that education, but also by having judges who represent the people who appear before. And and I am hopeful that in this administration that there will be some change. And I'm aware of, of particular nominees. Um, I believe that there is there is a, a nominee who is blind, and this will be the, f- the first possible blind jurist, which would be fabulous. Yes, right? it, it it's, a pers- be. it's a perspective that um, lived experience is something that you can't get otherwise um from a book you have to live it and i am hopeful that we are moving forward i'm not a patient person and you know we've had these conversations before and we've talked about the things that should be done and it is hard not to have blood pressure start you know getting into that red zone when you start talking about these things but we have to continue raising it teaching this generation, you know, another another issue of 
when do we learn? My wife and I have this conversation. It's like, when do we learn? And what happens is the, the generation of today does not know about Willowbrook, does not know about um, a lot of things and even things from the 90s, maybe. And it is imperative that we pass on that information and that it not be just ignored. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely is. Um, you know, I, I am married to somebody that works in a school district and um, you see regression in certain aspects of, of how we're educating certain people with disabilities. And it, it pains me. And, and then I hear what you just said, and you're right. We can't go backwards. You know, it should be a common core class on disability history because we can't make the same mistakes that we made in the past. And if we don't educate, we will. Um, and then that will lead to more, more of you and me speaking up, right? Because that's what we need to do. You know, you mentioned that the, the uh, the jurist, you know, it's, I get, I said, when I said before, make an intentional act. I mean, we have to intentionally add people with disabilities everywhere. You know, we're one, one sixth of the population, probably more than that. And we have to do that. And so in every capacity, when we can add, and, and, and yeah, is it affirmative action? Are, are conservatives against that? Sure. But you know what? It's real life too, that you know, we are one sixth and it should be representative, at least closer to representative. Right. And so that in our world, when we deal with federal contractors, contractors and subcontractors trying to get 7% of their employment basis, people with disabilities to disclose, you know, it's, it's, it's not just to be proud of that. It's that, Hey, that makes it intentional. And then that goes throughout the whole culture. So the, the jurist who's blind, you know, it's not that one jurist, it's the conversations they have behind the scenes, which will then affect all of the other employees. That's where it really matters more than anywhere else. That's why, you know, I, I, I beg people with disabilities to run for office just so that you get that perspective um, and go to work, all, all parts of society, just so that we, we get out there, get seen and heard and understood, and then that will bring the perspective together. You know, we've done a pretty good job of it in grade school and junior high school, and now it needs to it needs to go through. It needs to keep pushing through into higher education and beyond, so that we have more inclusion. I have a question for you both about representation. You're, you know, you're talking about uh, really having people who are representing a, a, a community in every aspect of life. We're talking about the judicial system. We're talking about government. We're also talking about entertainment, where there's a big push seemingly right now to ensure that characters who are on television, and John, you have had a lifelong experience with television and production, that those people are portrayed by people who actually have the disability that they are participating in that storyline on. And it's, it's such an interesting shift uh, in that uh, in the past, there has been, uh, you know, critically acclaimed uh, movies and productions because someone who doesn't have, have a disability is playing someone with a disability. And that certainly is not representation. That, that is not allowing for the imagery and or the representation of a person um, who has a particular disability being able to identify. So how important is that for people to be able to identify with people who are representing them, whether it's in media, the government, um, or, or in the judicial system. And it, it's so important. Um, you know, and I, and I have never been one about the, like the Hollywood industry. Uh, it, it hasn't been one of my, uh, topics that I think about or publicly talk about, but it is true. It would be a lot better if, uh, you know, if it wasn't Tom Cruise in the wheelchair in that eighties movie, right? I mean, it would have been better to have a real person, uh, that lives in a wheelchair it, to, to portray that. 
I think, you know, you saw Marley Matlin come out in, in you know, the nineties and two thousands. And that was great. You have somebody who's deaf playing somebody who's deaf. I mean, there are great actors with disability. It's just, we need to be hired and, and then we need to portray it. It needs to be realistic. <laughs> I mean, you, you, it, we know when it's not realistic, you know, obviously amputation is different, right? I'm not, you know, that, that's, that's different in and of itself, but you, you can find actors who are amputees. You can find actors who are blind, actors who are deaf and actors who are in a chair. And, and, and you should do that because it is, it is the way it should be. Does Tom Cruise sell more tickets? Yes. But does that mean that Marley Matlin won't? No. Right. So we have to, we have to do that. And if we are going to be equal in society, we need to be portrayed and represented closer to equal than we are now. And, and I think that's really, really essential. And, and the stories need to be real. It can't just be feel good that, you know, a person with a disability is inspiring and everybody wins in the end of the movie. No, you know what? For me at three foot nine, it hurts. It hurts to sit for a long time, to to walk for a long time. Uh, it it's not easy getting a step stool everywhere to go to the bathroom. You know, it, there's real issues that are ugly, ugly issues that you know you don't want, but they have to be there. And it maybe it's a feel good movie or t TV show or or issue on you know in in one of the our governments, but there also needs to be some reality to it. You know. I can see why it's happened in the past years, especially in media, having lived in the media world. The media world is a completely vain, completely vain world. It's look at me, look at me, look at me, how pretty I am. And so what we're saying is stop doing that. And, and you know, it, it, they can't do that. Uh, one of the, one of the, it's one of the frustrating reasons why I got out of it. You know what? I, I, I couldn't deal with that anymore. Um, and I think we as consumers, we as advocates, we as people with disabilities or allies should ask more of that. It would be very much more helpful. I agree. I find, I find when I'm watching TV and there is someone being portrayed as having a disability, it immediately pops into my head. Is this person just acting and if I'm unclear, I mean, I am looking immediately and it is one of the the first searches that I do. And my reaction is like, why? You can do better. And the way you do better is by doing better. Yeah. And and I think part of it also has to be with the fear of, you know, for, for people with invisible disabilities to, to come out and, and to be to be seen is very difficult. I think the the whole the whole issue regarding Britney Spears right now is is really shedding a light on things that people didn't talk about as well as the woman, you know, from the French Open who didn't want to talk to the press. Um, these are real issues. And the takeaway can't be that you get fined because you're not living up to some you know, preconceived persona and requirement that makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. So you know what I've, I've, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No. And so until these issues are brought forward and, and you look at them and that there are real people with real effects, nothing's going to change. And, and we do need to keep just shouting it from the rooftops. I, you know what I've noticed in myself, and I, I don't know if I intentionally have done it or not, but I, um, it's interesting if, if you were to case study me here, it, really since COVID began some 18 months ago or close to it, I stopped, I really stopped watching television. I, you know, we stopped watching Netflix and HBO and I, I really haven't done a lot of that. What, what I've done is gravitated to story arcs in books. And so I've been, I've been, uh, absolutely addicted to aud audible audio books. And I've noticed the characters in the books that I'm interested in have lots of people with disabilities in them and they're just mainstream stories and yet the, the, it seems like every writer right now is including people with disabilities more and more you know you go back to game of thrones and i i listened to all and read all the game of thrones books both read and listened and obviously watched the tv show but game of thrones was 
full of people with disabilities. Um, you know, I'm reading J.K. Rowling's other series, Cormoran Strike, which is a detective who lost his leg and is living in London. And she talks about the pain of having an artificial leg all the time. And it's, it's brilliant. It's not pretty. And she's talking about it not being pretty. Um, and he's not running to chase somebody because he can't, right? And because it's real, real world. And he's gaining weight because he can't exercise. It's real world. And, uh, you know, there's a fantasy series my daughter got me involved in, written by Brandon Sanderson. And five of the characters in that are, are people with disabilities. And one has um, m- multiple personality issues. Like, see, it's it's cool what's happening in the written word. Why isn't it coming through into into the visual world, visual medium yet. I think it will when we demand it. But I've stopped watching. Maybe that's partly why. So you just brought up COVID and and some changed behaviors for yourself, John. And we've seen an entire culture shift, not only in New York State or or the United States, but globally. Uh, People have needed to go home and stay home and work from home and Uh, accommodation became the culture. And so what does that say about moving forward? Uh, If if we ever get post pandemic, um, how it is that, especially in terms of employment and accommodations, what things have changed because of COVID? What do you both see moving forward as a possibility of, of change for employers in general? And how how do we as an audience um, start to look at uh, these accommodations for ourselves moving forward? I, I think um, it, we're at a, we're at an interesting point because of COVID, right? I mean, we have had to go home to work, and we've we've made a, a more accessible work center for certain people with disabilities, and that's been great. And I think we we have started to teach corporate America that it can be done this way. And so if it's physically easier for me to sit in my, you know, my home office and not put a dress shirt on, not worrying about tucking in my shirt and, 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 you know, all the nonsense that I have to deal with just to look like everybody else, I'm a lot more comfortable and I'm a lot more productive employee. That's just my, ex, ex, you know, experience. But we've taught businesses it could be done a different way and we can include individuals with disabilities in that. I would be really worried if, um, if we were not in a labor shortage before COVID. If you remember before COVID, we were still in a labor shortage and so people with disabilities were starting to be included. We're coming out of COVID, we're still in a labor shortage. So we're at this point where we can say, hey, remember during COVID when we worked virtually, we can do that and be more inclusive for people with disabilities now. If it didn't look like we were going into a labor shortage, I would be extremely worried about our population because we not only were unemployed to begin with, then lost jobs when the restaurants and, and shops closed, and now we're going back. But because we are in a labor shortage, we just have to train train around it, present ourselves differently, and and look for those remote remote opportunities to become more more open. And I think they will be there. So a lot of the work that we're doing is telling companies, hey, you had to think different, continue to think different be inclusive and let's let's think about accommodation in a different way that can assist your workforce and and people with disabilities they're listening now because they're desperate i mean ally bank is a national bank they work with us they need people they told me they don't need 3 people today they need 345 people today they don't care where they work and where they are they want people who are talented and so that's when I hear that, that says to me, we'll deal with the accommodation we need to deal with. You find us 345 people that can do it. That's the opportunity that we have right now that we have to embrace. And when I say we have to embrace it, not just our ability and jobs ability with what we do, but parents, caregivers, disability service providers, educators, individuals with disabilities themselves, we've got to embrace it, take up the challenge, uh, get trained to the ability that we have and put ourselves out there to lead the best lives we can. And, you know, so for some people that is social security disability benefits for others, it's not, we need to expect more from ourselves and ask more from ourselves and achieve more. I'll just add that from a legal perspective, the argument that 
it is a fundamental alteration to your business uh, for you to work from home flies in the face of what's happened over the last 18 months. So if we are able to put some type of um, spin on these last 18 months, I would say what you claim to be was impossible in in February and pre, you know, 20, 2020 February um, doesn't hold water anymore. Uh, the defense's case does not hold water. Um, yes. I, I, I'd aim into that. You know, you, I'm, I'm also addicted to CNBC because I think you get the real news out of the money because we're a capitalist society. You know, I think it was JP Morgan that said, we're all going to go back, back to work. Well, guess what? They're kidding themselves. They're not going to go back to work. There's going to be a certain percentage that will not do that. You know, I know here in, in Albany, we, we've been told that, that, you know, you're supposed to report back to work July 1st if you're a state worker. Guess what, folks? It's not going to work. You're going to have a lot of resignations, a lot of people moving around because they don't want to do that. So open up your mind. Think differently and and get it through your head that we've just proven to Tim's point, we can do it. Let's not be so pig headed that we just exclude now. Let's let's figure out how we do it for the better of our organization, business, government, society, et cetera. Uh, it, it's a lot happier for all of us if we are comfortable than if we're uncomfortable. There are many benefits that have nothing to do with the employment realm, just the ability to be at home, um, to, to theoretically wear shorts during a podcast, right? Even, even though maybe one per, maybe you have a, a, a you know, a, a button down shirt, right? Um, Theoretically, theoretically, um, but also the time. Forget forget about money, but time, travel time to and from. You know any type of of brick and mortar location, that's a drain on on your body, on on everything that you do during the day. It takes away from being with family. It takes away. Um, from all of the fun things that you might want to do. So there there are many, many upsides to working remotely when you can. You look at the anxiety that I'll pick on the state workers again, because I've got a good friend that's about to go through this, the anxiety that they're going to have going back to work every day. They, they, they are dreading, dreading it. <laughs> you know, and you feel that you, you feel the pain. You, you live that pain. I mean, I didn't realize how much I dreaded trying to tuck in a shirt. Th that simple, that simple a task and worry about that being the, the way I was seen all day long for 16 years in the TV industry. That that's ridiculous. You know, I, now would I ever do that again? No, you're going to get me with the way you get me a golf shirt untucked or t-shirt and you're going to be happy with it. And, you know, to, to H with you, if you're not, if you're not happy with it. Now, if I'm at a black tie event, I suppose I'll have to figure it out. But, uh, you know, I don't really have to do that anymore. And that anxiety gets shed away. One small thing. But for me, it was a big deal. And you're going to have this now coming through. And in Albany, New York, and New York State, you're going to have this in an amazing way in the next three months. The anxiety level in New York is going to go up if you demand people go back to work the way they, they used to do it. It's not going to be healthy. One of the other things that COVID uh, really overshadowed shadowed for us was it was it was the 30th anniversary of the ADA, right? We we started out talking about that. Um, we really didn't have a, a big um, celebration anywhere. Everyone was pretty much at home. So here we are in the 31st year, and there's so much still to be done. And we've talked a little bit about some of those areas, but. What are some other areas that you both see as really immediate issues um, that that are still out there that need to be addressed and um, and and the education needs to be there as well? Tim, you lead. There are many issues, right? And and 
I focus on the day-to-day issues. And maybe they're they're not super sexy, but accessibility of sidewalks, I would be incredibly happy if we could get that right. We know what it looks like, right? So maybe maybe in some other more complex legal issues, it may be difficult to map out what a solution is. This one is very, very straightforward. And that is something that I would love to see in my lifetime. Baltimore, uh, the city of Baltimore was just sued for this issue because their, their, their sidewalks are not accessible. We've had a lawsuit against the city of Troy for years now regarding the inaccessibility of their sidewalks. We have done surveys down in Manhattan where the videos are just outrageous. Like you get to a corner and someone who is using a wheelchair is faced with a six inch drop. So the person now has to backtrack down the street and find some curb cut and then hop into the street and come back up to cross Madison Avenue. So I would be happy if if we could focus on those daily things and to make it a little bit more attractive, accessibility is for everybody. So if you have somebody who's pushing, you know, a wheelchair, I'm sorry, a, I'm sorry, a, um, uh, a, a crit. A oh, good stroller. God. Thank you. Stroller. A stroller. I was going British. I was going to say pram, but that, that yeah. was my heritage. <laughs> But someone pushing a stroller or or pushing a food cart, like any one of those things would be benefited. And anybody who is using one of those assistive devices would be benefited by um, accessible streets. Every city should hire a person with a disability. Every office of general services in a state should hire a person with a disability. Every state and city should have a chief accessibility officer. I mean, it's, it's, there's a simple, very low cost act that would demand change. Uh, because if, you know, if I were working in, a, in the city, I'm going to pick on Albany again, and I, I don't mean to, but I'm downtown. So there I am. If, if I worked for Albany, I would be vocal to make sure sidewalks, streets, you know, traffic signals were accessible. I mean, I would make that happen. Or I'd get fired because I tried to make that happen. I mean, that's the, just the way it is. Make it, this is what I said at the beginning. Make an intentional act. So we tell businesses all day long who ask us, how do you be inclusive? And I say you make an intentional act. Microsoft builds products, hires people with disabilities. They do it intentionally and helps everybody in universal design. Why don't you do that in the state of New York? Why doesn't the state of New York have a chief accessibility officer? Why doesn't the city of Albany? have a chief accessibility officer. And you know what? Your sidewalks, your bridges, everything would be different and it would be better for everybody. You know, you Tim, you, the image you just painted with Baltimore and, and Troy, you know, the first thing I noticed traveling to Sydney, Australia, other than how tired I was getting there, was how amazing the sidewalks are. I, I mean, amazing. There are curb cuts everywhere. There are the appropriate you know, bumps for people using canes. Everything's got an audio audio signal and it's everywhere. It's not just one place. It's all over the, the city of Sydney. What did they do? They made an intentional act and we have to demand that. That's what we need to be, what we need to do. And for the taxes we pay, we should have that. We should have that. It has been such a great conversation with both of you today. Thank you for all the information and your insights. And uh, I'm sure this is not going to be our last conversation. So thank you both so much for being here today. And I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you, Catherine, for having me. Tim, great job, as John, always. Thank, thanks for coming to our neighborhood. We really appreciate it. You know, I'll be happy to come back to yours again. We'll um, and soon. I look forward to us doing this in person. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, John. Empire State of Rights closed captioned has been brought to you by Disability Rights New York.
your source for disability rights and advocacy. If you enjoyed our program, make sure to subscribe, like, and share this post. If there is a subject you would like us to discuss, please email podcast at drny.org or comment below. Tune in next Wednesday, where we'll bring you more information on disability rights in the state of New York. The closed captioned and ASL version of this podcast is available on our YouTube channel. To listen to more Empire State of Rights closed captioned, follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify.